Be honest, who hasn't had a cup of coffee at least once in their life? I'm sure that all of you, absolutely all of you who are watching, have consumed this product at some point. And then of course, there are people like me, who spend the day hooked on this pleasant and revitalizing drink. Can you imagine starting the day without a fresh cup of coffee in the morning? I really can't. Coffee has become one of those global products that can be found in practically any corner of the world. Now, haven't you ever wondered what's beyond your steaming cup of coffee? In this video, we're going to tell you about the main details, characteristics, and challenges of this exciting industry, a market that is not much talked about, but nevertheless is one of the largest in the world by volume of economic transactions. These days, more and more coffee is being consumed. As you can see, we're not talking about a small industry by any means. During 2020, the coffee business moved more than $450 billion. Are you ready to dive into the exciting world of your morning beverage? What's more, this time we will also be able to hear the experiences of Ethic Hub, a company dedicated to crowdfunding coffee producers. They were the ones who gave us the idea to make this video. Let's get started. The coffee industry is perhaps one of the least known of all the major industries in the world. For example, Latin America is home to 70% of the world's coffee bean production, while the six largest producers in the world are Brazil, Vietnam, Colombia, Indonesia, Honduras, and Ethiopia. Then among the top 10 producers, we also find Peru, Guatemala, and Mexico. So far, no surprises, right? They are all low-income countries with significant pockets of poverty, mainly in the countryside. However, alongside Brazil, Colombia, and Vietnam, in the top six of the largest exporters, we also find Switzerland, Germany, and Italy. Is that something that strikes you? Exactly. In the coffee market, the biggest producers are not always the ones who earn the most money from coffee exports. And this despite the fact that coffee needs very specific climatic conditions, a certain type of soil, temperature, rainfall, or altitude above sea level. In other words, coffee is only grown where coffee can be grown, which should give producers a certain market power. But of course, in order to illustrate, we could say that the bag of coffee we buy in a supermarket would be something like the equivalent of a cotton t-shirt in a clothing store, while the coffee picked in Colombia would be like a cotton just out of the bud. And of course, for both products, there is an intense process of transformation and value addition. Also, there's the addition of marketing along the way. We'll see why this is important later. But first, let's take a look at the case of Switzerland. Switzerland has the second highest income from coffee exports in the world, almost $3 billion. Despite the fact that there aren't any coffee plantations in the Alpine country, its coffee exports exceed even those of Colombia, which says a lot, especially if we take into account that in the Latin American country, more than 700,000 people work in the sector, and the country produces more than 14 million, 130 pound or 60 kilo sacks every year. These sacks are a type of measurement, which are to coffee what the barrel is to oil. Well, the point is that Switzerland imports unroasted coffee, that is, the beans as they come out of the field. Beans that are then roasted, packaged, and sold in a thousand and one different ways. And it is in this difference, in the transformation of a primitive product into a final product, where value is created and coffee multiplies its price. And that is exactly the reason why the Swiss country generates so much business exporting coffee without having coffee plantations. Companies such as the Swiss company Nestle, which is the third largest private importer of coffee, transform the primitive bean from Brazil, for example, into products as commonplace in everyday life in developed countries as Nespresso capsules. And this is the key to what makes coffee such a lucrative business. And it explains why coffee farmers in many cases do not even see a hundredth part of the price at which their production is finally sold to the consumer. But before anyone starts blaming the evil capitalists who squeeze the farmers, the truth is that everything has an explanation. And behind the explanation, there are also possible solutions. To what extent do the producing countries profit from the enormous global coffee business? How is it possible that Switzerland has a coffee sector as large of that as Colombia itself in terms of turnover? Well, let's see. But first, let's meet our friends from Ethic Hub. who wanted to support Visual Politic and have a project that has caught our attention. Note, when you finish watching this video, you will understand everything much better. And now, allow me to ask the first question. What exactly is Ethic Hub? Thank you, Josh. 
Ethihub is a very ambitious social impact startup using blockchain technology so anyone can finance small coffee producers with no access to the traditional financial system. For their lenders, good profit is not enough. They also want their money to be used to generate opportunities to improve the lives of the farmers through their own work. A true win-win. How interesting, Gabriella. Personally, this kind of project sounds phenomenal to me. I love the idea of combining profit with development. But why do you think your model is better for the coffee industry? Traditional coffee markets are obsolete and monopolized by large companies not interested in improving the financing conditions of the farmers, so they live in poverty despite despite producing almost 80% of the world's coffee. Etihad financed a shorter supply chain where every link adds value, so the final price of the coffee also benefits the producers. Well, in this video, we're going to explore all these issues. But Gabriella, there is one question that I have to ask. What are the advantages of backing Ethic Hub when it comes to investing? You can improve the world with your superpowers, your ability to decide where to spend or to invest your money. Together, we are proving a better economic system is possible, more sustainable, more inclusive and profitable. From your computer or your phone, you can lend as little as 20 euros and get an 8% annual return. Join Etihad and change the world one cup of coffee at a time. Thank you very much, Gabriella, for your support in putting this video together. We'll leave a link to your website in the description for anyone interested in learning more about your project. And now, for all of you, I repeat the question. How is it possible that Switzerland has a coffee sector as big as that of Colombia itself in terms of turnover? Coffee's Footprints The coffee industry has changed enormously over the last decades, from capsules to vending machines to Starbucks. The coffee industry is constantly changing, and it seems it's the experience that counts more and more. What has not changed so much is the situation of the main coffee producing countries, at least not for this raw material. <laughs> Coffee growing regions are still, in many cases, synonymous with underdevelopment. In concrete terms, we are talking about some 25 million small coffee producers, 80% of whom live below the poverty line. A billion dollar industry built on absolute poverty. For example, in Colombia, a country that exudes coffee from all sides, coffee exports barely account for 0.7% of its economy. And in Brazil, the world's largest producer, only 0.3%. In other words, coffee is more lucrative for the Swiss economy than for Colombia itself. That's crazy. But then the question is, what exactly is going on here? What problems do the producing countries have? Why are countries like Colombia, Honduras, and Brazil incapable of exploiting this enormous source of wealth? Well, we can mainly highlight three major obstacles. Firstly, there is the size of the producers. Between 70 and 80% of all the coffee produced in the world is produced by small farmers on small farms, small plantations. And this, which at first sight may seem to many of you to be an irrelevant fact, and to others even a scenario that invokes activism and social romanticism, those small farmers getting ahead with their own hands, working the fields morning, noon and night, is key to explaining why coffee is more lucrative in Switzerland than in Colombia. <laughs> You see, the vast majority of those 25 million small coffee producers are in rural and impoverished areas of countries that are already quite poor. In other words, we are talking about economic producers without sufficient economic means to invest in capital goods, such as tractors, with which to improve the productivity of their plantations, or the means to develop more complex business models. It is the snake that bites its own tail. Not having resources prevents them from developing, and by not developing, they don't have the resources they need to prosper and improve their standard of living. And here we find the second major problem facing small coffee farmers. If one or more of these farmers wanted to set up their own coffee roasting and processing plant, they would need huge amounts of money. That is, they would have to take out a loan or find an investor. Problem, as we saw in the video about how Peru went wrong. In these countries, the financial markets are very underdeveloped, so that getting a loan for a farmer is almost an impossible task. And if he were to do so, he would face interest rates that could exceed 40% per annum. <laughs> So in short, they don't have money to grow. By not growing, they can't prosper. And by not prospering, they can't access a loan. To make matters worse, and this brings us to a third major problem, by not developing more complex activities, small farmers are totally exposed to the price variations that occur on the international market. For example, when there is a good harvest, if this occurs across the board, or when planting increases, farmers may see prices plummet to well below their cost of production. Look at this chart to see how volatile the price of coffee can be. 
And the question is, how the hell can you escape from this kind of vicious cycle? Well, here we could find at least two possibilities. One would be to encourage the grouping of coffee farmers into cooperatives, so that amongst themselves, they could form a larger entity that would be able to more easily access technology, better trading arrangements or finance. They could even support each other if necessary. But of course, we are still talking about castles in the air. For these small farmers who in many cases cannot read or write, it is not so easy to develop more complex organizations. And it also requires the participation of many producers. Producers who cannot always change their traditional activity because they live from day to day. If they sell to a buyer, they have to keep selling to him in order to be able to eat. It's a mess. On top of that, the big issue is not solved either. Just the process of forming business entities or cooperatives requires money. Along the same lines, in some countries, there are institutions that have tried to deal with this problem. For example, there is the National Federation of Coffee Growers in Colombia, an entity born in 1927 that, through the so-called National Coffee Fund, ensures the purchase of all the production of its members at market prices. This entity, mandated by the Colombian government, operates through a network of 36 cooperatives and more than 500 purchasing points throughout the country. Thanks to its greater bargaining power in the market, the Federation achieves substantially higher prices than a small farmer would. We are talking about amounts that can be 40 or even 50% higher. Each year, these cooperatives manage more than 30% of the entire Colombian production. The problem is that, whilst very useful, in many cases it has proved to be an insufficient instrument in the end. Why? Because they have guaranteed small farmers the purchase of their production, but they have not gone much further. In the end, these types of large bureaucratic entities with little exposure to the market have limitations. And the best proof is that after 75 years of life, this federation took the leap and launched the Juan Valdez coffee chain in order to increase the value generated by Colombian producers. They already have more than 120 establishments around the world. It is the real Colombian rival of Starbucks. Surely now you understand why this brand uses the slogan, El Café de Todo Un País, the coffee of the whole country. I really hope I said that right. In any case, this is where the second possibility arises, that of being able to access collaborative microcredits, an instrument that, little by little, has been gaining more and more ground. And what do these microcredits consist of? Well, they are small loans that are given without the need for a guarantor and with market interest rates, but much lower. With them, a small farmer can buy more land, buy a tractor, buy machinery, etc, etc. In this way, they could escape the vicious cycle. They have access to resources with which to grow. And as they grow, they improve their standard of living and repay the loans. And in the process, they turn the problem around. And this is why collaborative microcredits are growing so much in underdeveloped countries. It seems that promoting these types of formulas could contribute to greatly reducing poverty, especially in Latin America. We are not only talking about the more than 25 million small producers, but also about millions and millions of people who could improve their lives by improving the local economy in rural areas of countries such as Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, Honduras, and Guatemala. To improve the lives of coffee farmers and turn this industry into an engine of wealth does not require less market, but quite the opposite. But having got to this point, it's your turn. Have you ever stopped to think about what's behind the coffee you drink every morning? What do you think would be the best formula for improving the lives of the millions and millions of people who grow coffee? Leave us your answers in the comments. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe to Visual Politic if you haven't already done so. Take care, and I'll see you in the next one.